sing, everything's all right in my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house, in my father's house, in my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house. There is joy, joy, joy. if you'd like to. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, make me a nail upon the wall, fastened securely in its place. Then from this thing so common and so small, hang a bright picture of thy face. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic this morning is, he is eager to answer. He is eager to answer. If you could meet a thousand people and another thousand, another thousand that we meet through the weeks who have come to the conclusion that somehow the answer is not for them, you will want to share with them this great truth. God is eager to answer. I want to share it with you from the Bible. You recall in our first study together, we explained that the science of prayer involves two features in particular. One is to pray about solutions rather than problems. And the second is to claim Bible promises for those solutions because the promise contains the solution. In or after service, after the first study, somebody said, how do you claim a solution for worry, for instance? Uh, how would you go about a solution for worry? We said, it all depends on what you're worrying about. If you're worrying about finances, then claim a promise like uh, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added. And think in terms of the solution to debts, which is being out of debt. Isn't that wonderful? If you're worrying about a child on drugs, claim a promise from the Lord like Isaiah 49, 25, which says, I will save your children. And think of those children as being saved and talk to the Lord about they are being saved, you see. If your problem is some loved one who has never found Jesus, then you might claim a promise of the opposite, which is a solution like Psalm 2, verse 8. I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance and say, Lord, I see that individual as a beautiful, humble, believing child of God. So the science of prayer involves two important things that have been almost entirely ignored by us all, right? We've gone into orbit about the problem. God wants us to go into orbit about the solution and find a promised solution. And since God is true and since a gift is in the promise, he wants us to talk to him about the opposite of the problem. Somebody last night after the meeting said, what about temper? How are you going into the opposite around temper? We said, claim Isaiah 26.3. It promises peace. 
So you'll say, Lord, I ask you to give me peace. I believe you're giving me peace. Thank you, Lord, I am receiving peace. So you're talking to the Lord about peace. You're going to orbit about peace. My friends, it can completely revolutionize our prayer lives and our entire lives. Now, as we're doing this, as we're talking to the Lord about the solution, it's very important to know that we're not merely talking about a solution. We're talking about a solution in Jesus Christ. He is the solution. He is our peace. The Bible says so. We claim a promise for wisdom when we are nowhere ignorant, like James 1, 5. But it's not just wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, Christ is made unto us wisdom. So we look up in the face of Jesus Christ. We say, Lord, I'm claiming you as my peace. I'm claiming you as my wisdom. I'm claiming you as my forgiveness. I'm claiming, claiming you as my salvation. Do you see? Try it, friends. No matter how unworthy we feel, try it. And that brings us to our study this morning. To think of our Lord as being eager, answer, eager to answer prayer, extremely eager, is important. And I know there are many, many problems in connection with it, and we want to share with you a few of the solutions to the problems that the devil throws into our mind to try to keep us from realizing that God is eager to answer our prayers no matter though our sins be as scarlet, no matter though we may have been prostitutes or homosexuals or thieves or murderers, he is still eager, aren't you glad? Here's the text. Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus speaking. He said, if you then being evil, oh, we are evil. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. And the parallel gospel, Matthew says, he will give good things. With the Holy Spirit, he gives us all the good things. He said he's like a daddy. In order to think of God as a daddy, some of us will run into a problem. Many people have said to me, I, I can't identify God as a daddy, not in a positive way, because my daddy wasn't kind. Remember that you found some daddies that are good. Identify God with the good daddies that you have seen, do you see? And think of him as more beautiful than the most beautiful daddy you've ever seen in all the world. What does a real good daddy do for his child? What is his attitude toward his child? Perhaps this example will help us. There was a, a father and mother living in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, several years ago, and they had a little baby girl. She was 18 months old. Right in the dead of winter, one of those terrific blizzards came. And it, it, was, it was carried on for four full days. It left the streets of Boston waist deep with snow. Coincidentally, at the same time, their little 18-month-old daughter came down with a fever, and the fever lasted the four days also. During this period of time, the little girl ate nothing. At the end of the four days, the blizzard subsided and the little girl's fever subsided. But she was weak. She managed to kind of edge herself out of bed and kind of wobbled over to mommy and looked up into mommy's face. She was hungry now. And looking up into mommy's face, she said, Mommy, apple. She could hardly say apple because she was so weak. Mommy, apple. And mother knew there wasn't an apple in the house. And Daddy was sitting over near Mother, and Mother gave Daddy a searching look. And the little girl's eyes followed Mother's eyes, and it gave her a thought. I'll ask Daddy. So she went in a weakened condition, kind of wobbled almost, over to Daddy. And she put one hand on one knee and the other on the other knee and looked up into Daddy's face, and she said, Daddy, apple? And Daddy knew there wasn't an apple in the house. And he knew the snow was waist deep. And he knew you can't walk through snow waist deep. He knew you can't, you can't wade through snow waist deep. If you're going through, you've got to go on all fours. But he determined he would get her an apple. Putting on his heaviest winter attire, he went in the, out in that snow and he wallowed. 
Any of you have had the experience of being in snow like that, you know how exhausting it is. On and on he wallowed, and on and on, obsessed with a daddy's love for his child. Until somewhere, I don't know where, he found an apple. It was a little easier to wallow back because he could retrace his steps. But it was still with great effort. When he walked in the house with that one apple, he was huffing and puffing and perspiring and sweating. And he went over to his precious little daughter and handed her an apple. Why? Why? Because he was what? Her daddy. And she was his daughter. And the Lord Jesus said, if you are evil, with all the mistakes you and I make, if we still have that attitude toward our children, our Father in heaven has an infinitely more eager attitude to come to our rescue. And I say, Amen. What do you say, brethren? Amen. Now, I think I almost hear somebody thinking. <laughs> somebody is saying his heart. <laughs> if God is so eager as that, to come to my rescue. How come that some of the things I've asked God to do for me, they've never been done? How come? Let me share you an example that may help us with that problem. We have a daughter and a son. They're older now. <laughs> but one day when our daughter wanted it, it was just a little tyke, still crawling around. I walked in the front room and I was almost shocked to see my daughter in process of putting in her mouth a Gillette safety razor blade. And I cast a prayer heavenward instantly, and I said, Oh, Lord, help me. And the Lord impressed me, smile, before she closes her mouth on it, smile, because don't you remember, Glenn Coon, the only times you were ever ashamed of her was when she acted like you? And now, if she acts like you, will be proud of her. Smile broadly. And I smiled broadly. I said, Nita, Nita. And I walked toward her slowly, and she looked at me, and she said, Daddy, Nita. And I saw that blade just teetering on her tongue. Nita, Nita. And I walked slowly, no fast movements, please. And I slipped my thumb and finger into that mouth, still wide open and drooling. <laughs> and I slipped the razor blade out of her mouth. And when I got it outside, I said, Juanita, <laughs> it'll cut you all up. And she went. <laughs> now, friends, why did a, a daddy who loved his daughter, why in the world did a daddy who professed such love for his daughter not let her have what she asked for. Ah, the answer is simple. It was because he loved her that he not merely denied her of the razor blade, but he answered her, her basic desire. What was it? Something to eat. <laughs> and that brings us to a beautiful formula. And carry this with you, beloved. Carry it and say it again and again. God always gives us what we ask for or something better. Will you say it with me? God always gives us what we ask for or something better. Will those of you viewing this also join with us? Let's say it again. God always gives us what we ask for or something better. And put with it another formula. And this is what do people believe? You know, a lot of people say, God says yes, or God says wait, or God says no. Did you ever hear that? But let me give you something that's better than that. God does say yes many times. He does say wait sometimes. Follow me. But God never says no, period, to his believing child. Oh, for the sinner who doesn't believe, that's a different story. Never to his believing, trusting child d does God ever say no, period. You know what he sometimes says in place of that? No, comma. You know what the difference is between a period and a comma in a sentence? The period is the end of the sentence. The comma means, means something is following. Amen? 
And I love to hear your amens. They're good. They do you good. They do me good. God always gives us what we, no matter how sinful we are, if we come in simple childlike trust, he always gives us what we ask for or something better. But he's not about to give us razor blade cake or razor blade soup or plain razor blades. But he will supply the basic need that caused us to put the razor blade in our mouth. Aren't you glad that God has kept us many times from destroying ourselves because he had something better? So I give my daughter not another razor blade, but something good to eat. Jesus said, that is our Father in heaven. Think of him as the best father you've ever seen in all your life. And if somehow we don't still find ourselves able to break through, then think of Calvary. And notice this text, Romans 8, 32. Listen to this. And I believe, friends, this is the center. I believe it is the center of Christianity, Calvary. Don't you? Now listen, you all know the story of how Jesus came to this world. And did you know, my friends, that Jesus suffered 30, more than 30 years before Calvary in the flesh? He was mocked, he was ridiculed as a little child. All through his ministry, he was buffeted, ridiculed, made fun of, hated, despised. For 6,000 years he has been. 4,000 years before Calvary. But on Calvary, he carried the sins of the entire world. It wasn't death merely. It was a second death that he bore for you and me because he loved us so. Now Romans 8, 32, listen to this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, what? Everybody. Freely, everybody. Freely give us all things. Everybody again. Freely give us all things. Let's put, will you just tell your, give your first and last name now, everybody audibly a minute, now, as I'm going to give mine. Mine is Glenn Kuhn. Will you say yours? Glenn Kuhn. All right. Now put your first and last name where it says he freely gives us. Put your first and last name. He freely gives Glenn Kuhn, all things. Isn't that a beautiful Savior? That is what the Bible teaches us regarding God who is eager to answer our prayers. And I thank God for such a Savior. I thank God for such a Father, don't you? Keep looking to Calvary. Think of the ignominy, ignominious agony through which he passed for us. He will never forget us. A Christ who suffered, bled, and died for you and me, who was so terribly humiliated He'll never forgive us, forget us. Aren't you glad? So he's eager. The next point. Since we are talking about claiming 3,573 promises of the Bible, or clusters of promises, since we're talking about that, I want to be real sure that God will always keep his word. Don't you? It's very important. I know he's eager. How many agree with us that he's really eager? No matter how we felt in the past, amen. Now he is truthful. The Bible says he's truthful. Very, very truthful. The Bible says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Oh, I, I hug that to my heart again and again. I've hugged it for 30 years. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. That has changed his mind. Hath he said, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? So God tells the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. Aren't you glad? There was a lady came to one of our ministers. This is an example that it will do us well to study carefully. May the Holy Spirit keep our mind on it. She came to one of our ministers and she said, Pastor, I have a problem. See, that's why we're here, to help people with problems. I have a problem. Well, he said, maybe I can help you. Well, that's what I came to you for, she said. Would you help me with my problem? I I I'll, I'll try. What is your problem? She said, my problem is forgiveness. By the way, don't miss this afternoon at 
and don't miss any night, particularly Tuesday night. She said, my problem is forgiveness. Well, he said, there's a promise for that. Does anyone here or anyone viewing know a, a promise for forgiveness? Let's see your hands. Which one would you say? First John 1, 9. That's right. And what does it say? Let's quote it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That promise is that God will forgive us our sins if we confess them. He said, here's the promise. What are the ABCs of prayer according to Jesus? A is what? Everybody. Ask. The B is what? Believe. And the C is what? Claim it. How do you claim your baggage at the airport? How do you claim it? You take it. You lay hold on it. You don't, just don't say, I claim it. We're not talking about that kind of prayer that says, Lord, I claim it. We're take, talking about the prayer that says, Lord, I claim it by laying hold on it. Thank you, Lord. I have it. Don't miss that. That is the key to prayer. So he said, we'll kneel down. We'll ask God to forgive you. Then they believed it. He believed it. And he thanked the Lord that she was forgiven. He rose from his knees rather buoyantly. Sister, you are now forgiven, aren't you? And he thought she'd say, well, praise the Lord, yes. But you know what she did? She did what scores of people watching this program are doing. They're saying, Lord, I, I don't think so because I don't feel it. I just don't feel forgiven. Or, they, or they'll say, uh, uh, I don't believe I'm forgiven because I haven't made wrongs right. We talked two hours yesterday with a very fine gentleman whom we'd met in Vietnam. He said, I have been struggling for years or for a long period of time with this forgiveness. He said, I felt there was absolutely no hope for my soul. I could never be saved because I had the impression that I must go and confess to everybody I've wronged and I must make every wrong right before God would forgive me. He said, I've been married three times. How can I make wrongs right with the first two women? I've stolen. And he said, so I was bogged down. And I said, what's the use? The lady said, Pastor, that's what I came to you for. I've been trying for 40 years to find forgiveness. He said, have you confessed your sins? She said, I've confessed my sins hundreds of times. By the way, how many here have confessed our sins hundreds of times? Will you raise your hand? Way up high. Have you? Am I the only one? Yes. And I've never received forgiveness. Now, what would a pastor say? This is what he said. Do you believe the Bible? And he smiled. <laughs> she said, indeed I do. I believe every word of it. Isn't that wonderful? I believe every word of it. He said, then you believe this promise too, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. He said, have you confessed your sins? She said, Pastor, I've told you several times. I have confessed my sins hundreds of times for 40 years. He said, then you are forgiven, aren't you? And her face was clouded again. She said, Pastor, that's why I came to see you. I can't get forgiveness. Now, the pastor had a problem about now. <laughs> what in the world is he going to tell the lady when he's already read the promise? She's already told him she believes the Bible. She's already stated that again and again she has confessed for 40 years, hundreds of times. Now what's he going to do? <laughs> he could slap her on the wrist and leave, <laughs> but he didn't. I think just about now he claimed the promise of wisdom. Lord, what am I going to say? He repeated it two or three times. He, she came up with the same answer, a clouded countenance. I've tried it for 40 years. I've confessed for hundreds of times. I, I haven't gotten forgiveness. And then the Holy Spirit answered his prayer. He said, Sister, if the Holy Spirit pointed out one sin that you have not confessed, would you be willing to confess it? She said, I certainly would, Pastor. I certainly would. He said, What about that sin that is mentioned in 1 John Chapter 5, verse 10, the middle of the verse. And you know, my friends, the Holy Spirit can do more to convict a person in a second than you and I can in all day. 
And it says here, He that believeth not God hath done what? Anybody know? He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. And as gently as he could, as kindly as he could, as winsomely as he could, he pointed out that she had been making God a liar for how long? Forty years. Wouldn't it be well, sister, if we knelt together now? You know it took a lot of winsomeness to say it so the Holy Spirit could do his work. Wouldn't it be well if we knelt down together now and that one sin that you've never confessed, you'd ask God to forgive you for having made him a liar for the 40 years. And the Spirit took over. The lady said, ah, that is where I've done wrong. I have been making God a liar for 40 years. She said, Pastor, let's, let's fall on our knees and I'm going to ask God to forgive me for having made him a liar. He told me you'd forgive me and I haven't believed God. And they knelt together and she poured her soul out to God. And before they arose, she said, now, Pastor, I'm ready now to ask God to forgive my sins and to believe him. I say, praise the Lord and to thank him he has forgiven me. And she rose from her knees, the tears still trickling down her cheeks. Oh, pastor, she said, think of it, think of it. I could have had this peace 40 years ago had I just known that I just wasn't believing God. It's not a question of feeling. It's a question of does God keep his word? Amen. I was speaking on this subject down in Florida at a camp meeting some years ago. After the meeting was over, a medical doctor walked into the book and Bible tent and he turned to a minister there and he said, Pastor, he said, I have just received the shock of my life. The pastor turned and said, what? You know, doctors, physicians are never to appear shocked. You know, if they appear shocked, they tell a patient, you have cancer. <clears throat> Even if a patient didn't have it, they'd have it by the time he got through, you know, almost. So physicians are never to appear shocked or nurses. But he said, I have just been shocked. Well, the pastor turned to him and said, how, how, how come? He said, I was just in the meeting there and that preacher read to, to me from the Bible how that when I have not been believing that God has forgiven me as he promised, I've been making out that God is a liar. And I've been doing it, he said, an officer in the church. See how the Holy Spirit works? An officer in the church, and I've been making out that God is a liar because I have never really believed. The minister turned to him and said, uh, uh, friend, what are you going to do from now on? And the physician turned to him and he said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. And his face brightened. He said, from now on, I am telling the Lord and my friends that I believe God. I believe God has forgiven my sins. Friends, do you believe it? Do those who are viewing believe it? As you sit in the pews today, do you believe it? How many believe that God has forgiven our sins? Will you lift your hand real high? Praise the Lord. You are forgiven then. And we may find peace, Romans 5, 1 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We can walk out of this service with peace in our hearts. God keeps his word. God does not lie. Friends, it is a good drill to enter upon. I do it again and again in my life. I tell the Lord, it's impossible for you to lie. You promised me so and so. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Your word cannot pass away. Hebrews 6 says, by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away. My word will not pass away. Tell the Lord that. As you tell the Lord, expression deepens the impression. Talk faith and you have faith. Declare your faith and confidence in God and he will reward us. God is true. God is true.
indeed he's true. And we're to take his promise and believe it. Well, I was talking to that couple yesterday. They related the story of how when they were still alienated, hadn't seen each other for several months, and they were just mean to each other, as they told me. They said the little girl, the little tiny girl, I don't know how tiny, maybe six, was praying to Jesus that daddy and mommy would be reconciled. She was praying that daddy would come home. <laughs> Pretty good promise she could claim. Jeremiah 24, 6 and 7, they shall return. <laughs> I don't suppose she knew the promise at all. But the Holy Spirit put into heart something that we all need to learn because Jesus said we need childlike faith. She said, Mommy, <laughs> Mommy, let's clean up the house. Daddy is coming home. <laughs> and Mother knew Daddy wasn't coming home. And Daddy knew he wasn't coming home because divorce proceedings had already been started. And they, all they did was bark at each other. And the little girl said, let's, now let's go down and clean Daddy's room. And Mother said, Daddy's room was a mess because I didn't even want to be in the room. <clears throat> and my little daughter said, Daddy's coming home, so we want to clean up the house. We want to clean up his room, don't we, Mommy? And Mommy didn't have, have the courage to say, Honey, you're a silly little girl. She didn't have the courage to say that. Aren't you glad? Let's not tell people their faith is silly in the Lord. What do you say? So Mommy hardly knew what to do. She said, well, <clears throat> she swallowed and said, Okay, let's clean up upstairs first. She didn't want to go into that room. The little girl kept saying, Mommy, Daddy's coming home, so we clean up the whole place. Daddy's coming. We'll go down and clean up the room now, won't we, Mommy? Because Daddy's coming home. He'll be home. The mother said, inside of two weeks, Daddy was back home. Friends, it's high time that we don't let the world and a lot of professed Christians destroy our simple confidence that God keeps his word. What do you say? God forgives us when we ask in simple faith. And the devil tries to say, you don't feel it. The devil say, you're too wicked. But the Lord Jesus said, though your sins be as what? Scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I was flying some time ago, and up in the sky I saw something I had never seen before. I've seen it since. As I looked down from that, the height of that airplane, I couldn't see one square inch of earth. What do you suppose I saw? I saw clouds that looked just like wool. It was the most beautiful sight I have ever seen. We've flown quite a bit. I had never and have never since seen such a sight. All was wool, just like wool. And that text came to my mind and I said, thank you, Lord. I began to write, oh, thank you, Lord. You, in Jesus, you don't see any of my earthliness. You choose not to look at my past sins. Thank you, there I see it. You have it in the book of nature. You have it in the book of Revelation. It is so, Lord, it is so. That's childlike faith. And that's point three. That is what God wants us to have, childlike faith. Matthew 18, 3, except you become converted and become like a what? A little child. A little child. A little girl came to us to tell us her story. She said, I wanted a bicycle. I wanted a bicycle badly. She said, but we didn't have the money. And Daddy said sometime he'd get me a bicycle. And I started saving up a little money now and then, best I could, and a little more money and trying to save. But I still didn't have enough, she said. And, and I had just about enough to buy half a bicycle. <laughs> and you know, a half a bicycle isn't, isn't enough to ride on. It's awfully hard. Some kids can still do it. And she said, then I came to Daddy and I said, Daddy, <laughs> Can you get me a bicycle now? He said, I don't have, we just have about half enough. And she said, we went in the other room and we knelt down and prayed. I don't know what promise they claimed. And, and dear Jesus, she said, if you'll get me a bicycle, I promise you that I won't use it for selfish pleasure. I'll also use it to go around and enroll people in the voice of prophecy and faith for today and such like. She said, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. And she said, she said, and I kept saying, mommy, Jesus is going to give me a bicycle. He's going to do it. That's childlike faith. She said, one day I ran out and Daddy was talking to a friend of his who came with a pickup truck. And I said, Daddy, do we have enough now so we can get a bicycle? And my daddy said, we only have half enough. And she said, the, the, the neighbor said, 
you like a bicycle? She said, yes, I would like a bicycle. He said, I have a bicycle I bought for my daughter and was stolen. So I bought another bicycle and after I bought the second one, the police found the first. You can have this first for half price. She said, we had enough money. I jumped in his pickup. I went over, got this bicycle. She said, you know, Jesus is so wonderful. She said, I hope he comes while I'm still a little girl because she said, I'd like to sit on his lap and feel his face. That's Jesus, friends. He's eager. He's truthful. But we must approach him with the faith of a little child. Now, how does he answer in the promises? Follow me carefully. Follow me carefully, beloved. His promises contain his power. So number one, he's eager. Number two, he's truthful. Number three, we should have childlike faith. And number four, the promises contain the creative power of Jesus Christ. How do you know? How do you know? Psalm 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by what? The breath of his mouth. He spake, and what happened? It was done. You remember Genesis 1? God said, let there be light. <laughs> There's a light. He is light. His word is light. When he says light, light exists. His word is creative, as we mentioned in the first study. The gift that God promises is in his promise by virtue of creation. I found two texts that were wonderful to me back 30 years ago when I was learning this. Oh, they meant so much. And they're put together by my favorite author. They're Romans 4, 17 and Psalm 32, 33, 6 and 9 that we've just read. And the first says this, God calleth, follow carefully, God calleth those things that be not as though they were. In other words, in other words, God calls a thing that doesn't even exist. Now, when God names a thing that doesn't even exist, what happens? Anybody know? What happens? When God names a thing like light, let there be light. It did not exist on this earth. When God named it, what happened immediately? It did exist. When I take a promise, when you take a promise from God's immutable, eternal, impeccable word, it's a creative word. It is the word that made the world. Light, light existed. God calls those things that are absolutely non-existent. He calls them as though they were existent. For the moment he calls them, what? They do exist. For instance, if I stood here right now and I said, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everybody, if I said right here in front of me, there's a chair. What would I be guilty of, anybody? Of what? Hey, couldn't we use a little better word than lying? Uh, how about prevarication? <laughs> yes. If I said there's a chair here, there is no chair there. And it would not be true. But listen, follow me. If the Lord says there is a chair, what would there be there? There'd be a chair. The trouble with you and me is we're looking at what does not exist at the moment, as far as we know, but it does exist in the promise of God. Instead of our trying to work around and find answers from our vocabulary, we're to turn to God's immutable, eternal word. His vocabulary contains the gift that he promises. I can't understand it. I cannot understand how Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You ask me where Jesus was from the time she was first of child during those nine months. Where was Jesus? I don't know where he was except where the Bible says he was. I don't any more than, than what the Bible says. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Amen? Amen? I don't understand how God's creative word is so mighty, so powerful, that when he names a thing, the thing he names actually exists in that word, but it does. Thank God. What do you say? Amen. Thank God. So we're looking for solutions, but the problem, friends, is this. We're looking at the problem. We're talking about the problem when God has... 3,573 promises, every one of them contains a solution that's promised. His creative word is there. All kinds of habits we have, all kinds of obsessions, 
We keep talking about our habits and our obsession and our mistakes and all that. You'll not find that this evening. They're not glorifying their past life. They're glorifying Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. What is your problem? Wouldn't you like to write down between now and this afternoon a problem and behind that problem put down what the opposite of the problem would be? The solution and find a text. And if you can't find a text of scripture that you think fits identically, put it in the question box in our 6.30 service, do you see? And we'll spend time with you so that as we conclude this week, every person here, young and old, can know that God is eager to answer prayer, that God is truthful, that we'll come with childlike trust in him and reach up and take hold of his all-powerful word by which he made the world. And friends, that is the word which by the gospel is preached to us. Shall we pray? While our heads are bowed in prayer, there may be someone here this morning who would be saying, my problem is I'm a backslider. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, remember, first of all, that we're all backsliders. But there's a promise for your backsliding. Hosea 14, verse 4. It contains the solution. It says this, the Lord is speaking. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Hosea 14, 4. Right now, beloved, you can do what that couple did who came to my house after I'd learned these promises and had learned this kind of prayer with their home ready to break up, they were backslidden. They claimed Hosea 14, 4, and within one hour, there were new creatures in Christ Jesus and a home was saved. Will you ask God right now to heal your backsliding? And will you think of the healing love of Jesus? He's healing me because this is the solution, God's healing love. Not how unworthy I am, not what the devil tells me, no matter how far I've gone wrong, you're healing me, Lord, from my backsliding because you have creative power, you have Calvary love. As our heads are bowed in prayer, if you have slipped a little away from the Lord, and you will right now by his grace take his healing love with no eyes curiously looking around, would you lift your hand? I will take his healing. Amen. Amen. I will take his healing love. Lord, we ask believingly. We claim triumphantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand and sing, everything's all right in my Father's house. We can all really sing it, and those doing will sing with us. Jesus is the way.